I never anticipated that the last one of these videos would do so well, but it turned out to be one of my most successful War Thunder videos recently. As such, I decided to come up with another round. It only made sense after Spookston did a part 2 himself. These videos were my idea after all, I can't be letting you have all the fun. Obviously, the list of vehicles that people think should be added to War Thunder is endless and constantly changing, but it's nay often that you hear of vehicles that outright shouldn't. Apparently this is something a lot of you found interesting, whether or not you agreed with the points I brought up as justification. I suspect one of the reasons these videos got a lot of attention is because the idea of certain vehicles just not working in game right now kind of highlights issues or failings of the game as it's built currently. If this vehicle just straight up doesn't fit or would cause issues inherent to its implementation, then why is that? What would have to happen for that not to be the case? It's a very interesting discussion that I enjoyed seeing in the comments last time. I did after all say that there are various changes to the game, and in particular RRB, that would allow half the vehicles I brought up in the last video to fit in without these issues. I've narrowed today's video down to a smaller and hopefully less controversial list, and again I'd like to say that these aren't so much hard no's as maybe this vehicle wouldn't be a good idea right now for these reasons. I also thought I'd cover a couple of aircraft that I know a lot of you expected would be on the list, but I don't think actually cause problems and therefore could in fact be added even in the current build of the game. Let's get into this. First off is the IA-58 Pucara, a twin turboprop light ground attack platform made by Argentina. One of the biggest points of contention in the last video was the OV-10 Bronco, with a lot of people either upset about the fact that maybe it wouldn't work since they want to see it, or straight up disagreeing and saying that it would. The Pucara is probably the closest thing to the OV-10 in terms of capability and role. It entered service in 1975 and played a key role in the Falklands War in 1982. Compared to the OV-10, this aircraft carried a smaller bomb load but had slightly better performance. In terms of speed, the Pucara is about 100km per hour faster than the Bronco, just under 500 in a straight line on the deck, and would perform very similarly in terms of manoeuvrability. While the Bronco could only carry 20mm cannons in gun pods, removing the capacity for bombs and reducing its worth, the IA-58 had two 20mm in the lower fuselage, alongside four 7.62s. The problem, however, is the same as that of the Bronco only this aircraft is another 10 years newer. If you put it at a battle rating that reflects its performance and bomb load, then it would be fighting entirely World War II aircraft. The thing is from 1975, so that would just piss off a lot of players, and I think that matters. As I said last time, ground tech trees do have many post-war and even modern vehicles in amongst the World War II BRs, but aircraft don't, and I think we should strive to keep it that way unless absolutely necessary to fill gaps in trees. One thing people brought up about the OV-10 was that the very late variants were able to carry Hellfires and all aspect sidewinders, and would actually fit in the helicopter tree, as given its performance and role in real life, it would function more similarly to a helicopter that just can't hover than a traditional attack aircraft in game. I responded to this by saying that I think it would work, but you absolutely need equivalents for other nations to set that precedent. The Pucara is really the only one that exists, but unlike the Bronco, it never carried missiles, just bombs and rockets, and less than a P-47 carries, so it really has no place. As for nation, it would have to go to Germany. Someone did suggest that it would be French since it uses French engines, but Gaijin are firm on Argentine vehicles being added to the German tray. It was also captured by the British for evaluation, so it could go to Britain as well. I still don't even think it should be added, as both of those nations already have plenty of attack aircraft that fit much better, and options for more without resorting to time-travelling observation and counterinsurgency aircraft. Now onto a strange one, the Westland Welkin. This was a viewer suggestion in the comments last time, and I want to state right off the bat that I actually think this aircraft will come to the game. It was in the massive leak list a few months ago, and there's really no inherent reason it can't be added, but a viewer raised a valid point as to why maybe it shouldn't right now. Air battles in War Thunder used to be very altitude centric, with most players side climbing and calling anybody who didn't noobish and lazy. These days that doesn't tend to happen so much, with so many more attackers in game flying at low altitudes, most of the fighters end up not climbing much either. The Welkin was a very high altitude interceptor designed in the early 1940s to counter the Junkers JU-86P, a high altitude Luftwaffe bomber. By the time it was ready, the Luftwaffe was no longer conducting high altitude bombing missions and only 77 Welkins were ever produced including prototypes. The problem with this aircraft is that it basically only functions at very high altitudes and would be pretty useless at mid to low altitudes where all battles in War Thunder take place. Its wings would rip very easily and it wouldn't be very fast or manoeuvrable while having a god awful roll rate. 
This would be enough of a problem for the long wing Mark 7 Spitfire, but at least Spitfires climb very well. Heavy fighters don't tend to, so the Welkin just doesn't really have a role in game. That makes it unnecessary already, but at least it could be a decent bomber hunter. Here's the main problem. Putting the Welkin at any sort of BR where it can be remotely useful, it would also be the best performing fighter for its matchmaker at high altitude, meaning it could climb and then ruin games by camping at altitude and being practically invincible, without actually being able to accomplish much against fighters even then. It's a pretty standard interceptor problem, so while the Welkin might have fit perfectly in game 4 years ago, and it could still be added, Right now, it would just be painful to fly and even worse to fight against. That's enough for me to say I don't want to see it, which is why I chose to include it on this list. Again, changes to the game to better involve bombers and bring back the altitude meta would also help the Welkin by giving it more of a purpose, but right now I just don't think it should be on Gaijin's list of priorities. Next up is an aircraft that's seen somewhat of a resurgence in people asking for it since the Israeli tech tree was announced, the Foga Magister. This is a 1950s jet trainer developed by France and also used by Israel, with the unique feature of a butterfly tail. Its performance is quite similar to early jets, but its problem is kind of the opposite of the Bronco. It just isn't well armed enough to fit relative to its performance. The Magister carried two 7.5mm machine guns with only 200 rounds each it would actually struggle to kill any aircraft at its BR. Jet trainers often double as light attack platforms, so what about ground ordnance? Well, it's not looking good for rank 5. Two 50kg bombs are a couple of rockets. That's pretty much nothing for the BR this jet would have to sit at, and France already have the A1 Sky Raiders that make for much better ground attackers. Reduce the BR of the Magister to reflect its bomb load, and it becomes horrifically overpowered based on speed alone, while still suffering from that useless machine gun armament. I know what many of you will be about to say, what about its SS-11 missiles? With these ATGMs, it would actually be very similar to the Swedish SK-60B, just with no ability to be useful in air battles. The thing is, while I've seen several claims that the base Magister could be armed with these missiles, I've only ever seen images and evidence of the upgraded Magister 90 actually mounting them. This was a single prototype for an upgraded Magister, which could also mount 20mm cannons, but it lost to the Alpha Jet and was never mass produced. I could be wrong, and the base Magister could carry SS-11s too, including in his relay service, and if that is the case, then this jet could be added. Just ignore this section of the video. It would absolutely have to be a premium, or else receive those missiles stock in order to be usable. But if it's true that only the Magister upgrade could carry them, then the base aircraft just doesn't work. The upgrade could be added just fine, it would basically be a French SK-60B, but obviously Israel couldn't get it. The next aircraft is in a very similar situation, the Fuji T-1. This was the first post-war aircraft Japan developed, and served as a jet trainer for many years. Its top speed in a straight line was 780 kph, and it has been suggested as a viable replacement for the R2Y2s if they were to be removed, since they never existed. The problem is the same as that of the Magister. This jet was barely capable of carrying any weapons. Its internal armament was a single 12.7mm machine gun, and it could carry 14 HVAR rockets, 4 Zuni rockets, or 2 extra machine guns in gun pods. There are also claims that it carried bombs of up to 750 pounds as well as sidewinders, but actual evidence of this has been extremely difficult to come by. Out of the two original sources that claim it could carry bombs or missiles, one is a book with some known faults, and the other is a promotional pamphlet most likely published in attempts for Japan to export the T-1, given that it's written in English. A Japanese document does exist saying that it was planned to equip the T-1 with these armaments, but the fact that it says planned again makes me think that this was a potential upgrade to help the aircraft sell which it never did. Even if it did have them in-game, we again have the issue that this is a minimal armament for the BR that this aircraft would have to be. It would perform somewhat close to the R2-Y2s, being about 50 kph slower with less energy retention but a better roll rate, and given the pitiful offensive armament, could be 7.0 so long as it doesn't have sidewinders. Because of that, I honestly wouldn't be against seeing it, but having spoken to Gaijin about the T1, they have no plans for it and don't see it as worth adding, which I would tend to agree with. The problem with adding it with bombs and not sidewinders is that the only sources that show one also show the other, but Gaijin could just ignore that to keep its BR as low as possible. Of all the aircraft on this list, it's the one I'm least against adding, and causes no real issues besides how you'd stock grind it with only a single 50 cal, but at the same time, it's still pretty useless for War Thunder. The last aircraft on this list is the AC-130 gunship. God, I'm getting crucified in the comments. 
The AC-130 is a heavily armed version of the C-130 Hercules, designed to replace the original gunship, the AC-47. Which, before you ask, doesn't work either. The purpose of aircraft like this is close air support in the anti-infantry role, with the ability to circle overhead rather than something like an A4 or A10 that has to make a straight line run and then egress out to come back in for another. The AC-130 first entered service during the Vietnam War, after the AC-47 proved the concept. The AC-130 was much more heavily armed, with two 20mm Vulcan guns, a single 40mm Bofors, and even a 105mm gun, all on the aircraft's left side. The problem is that the 105 is a how with no anti-armor capabilities. Think of the gun from the M4 105 at 2.7. The Bofors gun could get a maximum of just under 100mm penetration, meaning it could actually kill some tanks, while the 20mm Vulcans are capable of killing some light tanks with either a top-down or a side approach. The AC-130U Spooky was also later upgraded with a 25mm from the Harrier II, which I'm not sure on the penetration of, but I'd hazard a guess it's in the 60mm range, or even a 30mm Bushmaster cannon, replacing the two Vulcans. Gaijin would have to fudge ammo for this one slightly, but the Mark 44 Bushmaster with APFSDS rounds can penetrate over 100mm, which is what the gun pods on the A7 have. This is sounding like an aircraft that, while it might not be good, could at least be a fun meme. I'll be honest, the reason I've always laughed at the idea of this aircraft in War Thunder in the past is a little less rock solid now with all the BMPs and BMDs, Mardos, Rattles, the Type 87, and even Weasels that have all been added in the last year. The biggest issue with the AC-130 is how you'd aim it, and more so, how would you fly and shoot at the same time. The purpose of the AC-130 is to circle overhead while continuing to fire, which is only possible because in real life, one person isn't controlling the whole aircraft. Gaijin could certainly give you the ability to put the aircraft onto an autopilot, where it would fly in a constant circle, allowing you to switch to the turrets and fire, but then you'd have another problem. You'll barely be able to kill anything due to lack of penetration. You'll have to be at some distance in altitude to get the right firing angles, and circling around won't afford you those top-down or side shots you need, which negates any killing potential you have. At a battle rating of 8.0, where it'd have a lot of IFBs and other light vehicles to shoot at, the AC-130 could at least be usable, but it's about the biggest free kill a Gepard or Shilka could ever dream of. When it comes down to it, the AC-130 is a dedicated infantry support aircraft. Forcing it into the anti-tank role in War Thunder for the sake of a meme vehicle would be like passing the Weasel off as an AA, where it'd have second gen thermals yet fight Shermans. Oh wait, Gaijin did that. That's it for my list today, I'd love to know what you think in the comments. One thing I thought I'd leave you with though is a few aircraft that some of you clearly expected to see in the first video, and even left in the comments, but I actually think could be added without any major changes to the game. Of course, improving the game would help them, but I digress. The first is the F-117 Nighthawk. This aircraft needs no introduction, but for any cavemen out there, it was the first operational stealth aircraft and was introduced in 1983. That's a mere one year after the MiG-23 MLD, the same year as the A-5C, and before the F-4E Kai or J-7E. Honestly, I just find that crazy given what this aircraft is. But that also puts into perspective what sort of BR this thing could be. Despite the F designation, the Nighthawk was in reality a bomber, carrying two Paveway or JDAM guided bombs of up to 2,000 pounds each, and no air-to-air -air weapons. It was subsonic at all altitudes, and had no radar. There's really no good reason that this aircraft couldn't work in game right now, considering the guided bombs we already have, and paveways and JDAMs were even going to be implemented and are sure to come back soon. Given its stealth, the F-117 wouldn't be possible to shoot down with a Sparrow or Skyflash, and it'd even be very difficult for SAMs to lock onto in ground battles. Its lack of speed would be made up for by its potent guided weapons. Think of a more advanced Buccaneer S-1, and that thing doesn't have any troubles. It wouldn't be difficult to kill, just not brain dead, and given its maximum of 4,000 pounds of bombs with only two drops, it wouldn't create any problems either. It would just be a curiosity, as even the fighters carry more than that, as do all the attackers at these BRs. Wouldn't it just be cool though? Next is the MiG-25 Foxbat. I was surprised at the number of people who think that this aircraft can't work, but I think most of them are probably either new to top tier or haven't played it yet but like to talk about it. The MiG-25 is best known for being able to reach speeds of up to Mach 3, but it was actually subsonic on the deck and barely supersonic at altitudes below 10,000 feet. It would also have horrifically poor maneuverability, being easily beaten in a turn fight by any top tier fighter. This all sounds very similar to the Welkin I mentioned earlier. Useless at low altitude, but with insane high altitude performance. So what's the difference? Well for one, you 
have Fox 1 missiles at this BR, so shooting down a MiG-25 that decides to run all game will hardly be an issue. 2. The MiG-25 took an extremely long time to accelerate to its top speeds. And 3. How many times have you actually hit Mark 2 in regular War Thunder air battles? If you're actually taking part in the fight, you never will. The closest I've come is Mark 1.8 in the MiG-21 Biss and 1.6 in the Phantom and MiG-23, all of which are capable of well over Mark 2. The MiG-25 might be even faster again in theory, but it'd be unlikely to ever surpass Mark II either. On the flip side, its R-40 missiles would actually be quite deadly, being similar to the R-24s on the new Flogger but with greater range and a larger warhead and like most Soviet missiles came in radar or IR forms. Unlike the Flogger, you'd actually be able to carry both at the same time, two of each type of missile, and you would also have R-60s as well. Not that you'd ever want to use them, the R-40s would just be better for you. Altogether, there's really no issue with it being added at 11.0. Even if decompression to 11.3 comes, that's the BR it would fit at. Lastly is the A-10. This is kind of the biggest one, and it's easy to see why people think it shouldn't be added. There seems to be two major camps. Either the A-10 would be completely useless given its lack of speed and the power of top tier SAMs, or the A-10 would be completely overpowered given its advanced guided weapons and its ability to take damage. Both camps deny that the other knows what they're talking about, but both agree that it wouldn't work in War Thunder. There seems to be very few people, and I count myself as one of them, who think that these two extremes just balance each other out. The A-10's signature party trick is of course its 30mm cannon, but in War Thunder it'd get far more use out of its late Mavericks and guided bombs. The AGM-65D Maverick would be similar to the B model we already have, but with a thermal sight, while the Paveway or JDAM bombs were again almost added this update. This offsets the lack of speed, which at the same time hampers it enough to not make it overpowered. The A-10 also carried AIM-9Ls or Ms for self-defense from enemy aircraft, and is surprisingly maneuverable. For all those calling it useless, because it can only go 500 kph while carrying ordnance, and in game we have modern SPAA, I don't think the speed is saving you many times in the A-7. If a SAM looks at you, you die. It's still a very capable aircraft. Either way, I'd put my money on the A-10 Warthog coming in 2022 it's just too famous to miss whether it works or not. To That's it for this video, I hope you've enjoyed and again I'd love to know what you thought about some of these points. I hope you're enjoying the new patch and I'll have plenty of content coming out on it over the next few weeks. In the meantime, I highly suggest checking out a guide we put up on assembling better lineups. It's a video I put a lot of work into and I think it turned out really well, but the algorithm seems to have skull fucked it for no reason. You can also get 3% off any of your purchases in the War Thunder store and our decal using the link below. Until next time, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you lads in the skies. Missile types, target information, and often entire engagements can be spoken using code words like these, and given that you're all definitely getting involved in air to air combat on a daily basis, uh, you'd better pay attention today. Well, welcome back to the ArmorCast channel, where in today's episode of Koala Explains, we're going over missile types and defining some of the common codes and air combat terminology you need to know. 